Okay, so um, I will share my screen for a moment because I already had a, the question from Jesper, what is this group and who are all these people? So I will start with a very small introduction before we start uh, with the three presenters of today. Uh, so I will share uh, my screen. Uh, and you should be able to see my presentation now. Is that right? Yes, we can see it. I don't know why I see this. Do you also see a strange green bar or something? But yeah. Okay, no. well. Um, but it's very oh. enlarged, Irma. It's, it looks as if you zoomed in. So we, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Even we don't see the, the, the zoom out. slides. Oh, now I see what I can do. Is this better? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and now? Yep. Yes. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Uh, something also a new feature probably. I have to have this. I have this green square box that I have to select what I'm presenting. Okay, so um, who are we? We are uh, the people who are organizing this are uh, four people who are all uh, involved in uh, the International Society of Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, the ISOTL, uh, which is the international organization uh, that connects all people that in, are involved with uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning. And ISOTL has many working groups uh, but also uh, a, a journal, the Teaching and Learning Inquiry, and also organize uh, an annual conference every year. And this year, the conference will be in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, the people organizing this are Katrina Martensen, who is uh, letting everybody enter this room now. And she is co-editor of Teaching and Learning Inquiry and also former co-president of ISOTL, uh, Reed Trulsen, Re, maybe you can just wave and say something. Uh, Re is uh, the former something. vice president, yeah, former vice president Europe. Uh, Claire Hampshire, who unfortunately could not be here, is uh, also one is the vice president Europe. And my own, my name is Irma Meijerman, and also uh, I'm vice president Europe. And I settle has for every region in the world they have uh, two vice presidents so there are two vice presidents europe and we are responsible for uh, representing uh, europe in the isoto organization um so let's talk about uh, the the conference uh, we are organizing the utrecht scholarship of teaching and learning conference this year in utrecht and the theme of this contract conference is context matters and I will not go into detail today, because but we have the teaching and learning context, which is about your student population, the courses, uh, all kinds of organizational aspects involved in teaching and learning. Uh, we have the disciplinary context, which is doing subtle with a certain disciplinary background. And that's the theme that we are talking about today as well. And then we have the institutional context that will be the theme of the next webinar, which is about recognition and reward of SOTL, uh, the support of institutes and how can institutes support uh, scholarship of teaching and learning. And then we also have the geographical and political context. And one of the things that is very often talked about is, for example, language issues. Uh, in the Netherlands or in Sweden or in Denmark, we, for example, we don't have a word for scholarship of teaching and learning. So how do you explain to people what it is? Um, so today we want to talk about uh, the disciplinary context, uh, scholarship of teaching and learning within the disciplines. And we do that with having three short presentations. And after the presentations, we will um, divide ourselves into breakout groups. Uh, and have a discussion about this team. And then we will, uh, last 10 minutes of this meeting, we will uh, be, be back together and see what has come out of this group discussions. So this is what I wanted to share. Are there any questions about ISOTL 
at the moment urgent questions because otherwise we go continue with the presenters. No urgent questions. Uh, we continue with the presenters, the most important part of the day. Uh, we have found uh, three people willing to present today, uh, which is uh, Deborah O'Connor from Manchester University, and she will talk about subtle in the health professions. Uh, we, have, we have Jesper, and probably I pronounce it wrong. How do you call pronounce your best surname, uh, Jesper? Peel. 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 Yeah. Peel. Yes. Uh, from the Faculty of Business and Social Sciences from the University of Southern Denmark. And we have not Vincent, but Rianne. Uh, Rianne van Lambalgen. Uh, Vincent is here, but Rianne will do the presentation about subtle in the humanities. So I will stop sharing my screen and I give the floor to the first presenter, which is uh, Deborah. Thank you, Emma. I'm just going to try and share my screen now. So please do let me know if you can see um, the slides. Okay, so you should be able to see now the slides. I'm just going to put it on slideshow. Let me know if it um, if there's yeah, any problems we, with, with, with with the viewing. Um, we can we can see you, Deborah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Good. OK, um, thank you for inviting me this afternoon to talk to you. Um, my name is Deborah O'Connor, as Emma said. I'm the Director of Placements and Partnerships at Manchester Metropolitan University, and I'm also a physiotherapist uh, by background. And um, I've been doing some work with colleagues across health professions, particularly um, looking at how do we um, how do we really embed scholarship of teaching and learning in those professions where we've got some real constraints and some real challenges because of the fact that we're professionally regulated and, and a lot of our curriculum is kind of given to us. So um, that's really the focus of my uh, very short presentation today. And I'm happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. And, and I suppose we, we were asked to think about some of the questions that are driven by our disciplines and, and the barriers and, and some of the challenges that we have to face. And, and these, to me, are, they're both questions and barriers, actually, uh, for, for health, anybody who works in the healthcare setting. Our curriculum is driven by our professional bodies. We have to provide um, graduates from our programmes that have a, um, all of the necessary requirements to give them a licence to practice. And so that is a, a both a, a question of how do we, how can we be inventive in how we deliver our teaching and learning methods when actually we've got core curriculum that have, we have to deliver. So it's both a question and a barrier. Um, they are skills based professions, so we need time in the curriculum for practice application and consolidation of those skills. So again, how do we overcome that? How do we ensure that we can be innovative and we can and we can really provide evidence based um, teaching and learning methodology to our um, our students in a way that enables them to have this space for, for application and practice of skills but at the same time learning um, is, is occurring throughout their program of study. And then the other issue that we have is that we work across quite a number of different universities in terms of those placements so that delivery of of those skills based elements when they go out into their field and they work um, in the settings that they're going to work in is very much um, quality assured and governed by external bodies again so again we've got that equity of experience how do we facilitate innovation in a in a system that really constrains it and so I've described us really as a square peg in a round hole because we are very much <clears throat> professionally driven, yet we have to try to be as innovative as we can be in our pedagogical approach to how we deliver our training. <coughs> what we have got, that's I think um, our core strengths as health professionals. And I, when I talk about health professions, I want to talk about that in the widest sense. So that's nursing, medics, um, allied health professions, all of the professions that actually um, deliver care to, um, to, to clients and patients in practice. We, um, as a group of, of um, individuals, have all of these skills. We work creatively, we work flexibly, we're problem solvers. 
the whole premise of the profession is built upon reflection in and on action based on Schoen's work. The communities of practice that healthcare professionals work in and that very concept of experiential learning is exactly what we have to utilise to ensure that our learners are able to take that what they've gained in terms of knowledge and skill from the academic institution and then apply it in a clinical setting or a practice based setting when they've got real patients in front of them. So these are some of our solutions. When we're thinking about pedagogy and we're thinking about that scholarship of teaching and learning in its widest sense and that creativity, how do we then utilise our very skills as healthcare professionals to ensure that our students have that, that really robust enriching experience in the classroom and beyond the classroom? So influencing the future, and, and this is just one project that I've been involved in, uh, which was around um, practice-based learning for physiotherapy students and um, latterly for occupational therapy students as well. And we were actually funded to complete a national project, which was looking at how do we find out what students need in practice? What do our colleagues who deliver that practice-based learning need, but what do our students need and what are their experiences? So we did a scoping literature review, we did some stakeholder engagement, we did a mixed methods research study to understand some of the key challenges and some of the priorities around practice-based learning. And that formed then a report which um, had some key recommendations. As a result of that work, we've actually influenced policy um, in the UK and these uh, practice based learning principles have been developed um, as a coordinated uh, piece of work between the Royal College of Occupational Therapists and the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. Um, and that is, you know, that that's come out of us investigating the core principles that underpin learning in a in a practice space. So that's one um, one piece of work that I've been involved in. Some of the things I would share really um, with colleagues around um, this particular discipline area is you have to find your subtle community. You have to find your own people, because if you don't know who your people are, you can't work in isolation to find the answers to the questions and the solutions that you're looking for. So working across institutions, working with other colleagues who understand your own language. And when I talk about language, I'm not talking about language in the sense of, of our nationality. I'm talking about language as in the words that we use to describe things, because actually as a professional in health, I might call something one thing and my teacher education colleagues would use the same terminology to mean something entirely different. So it's really important that we find the people to work with who speak the same language. And that then enables us as a community of practice to come together and say, how do we overcome this problem? How do we find a solution here that works for these disciplines? How do we take learning from one healthcare professional group and apply it to another, which is what we did with our physiotherapy project. Answering the question. So what is the question? Finding that community, developing the question and then finding the answers. Um, I was very fortunate to do some work with colleagues at, at Turku um, in Finland and Bern University in Switzerland uh, some years ago now, uh, looking at global opportunities. So that question was around student mobility and how do we provide opportunities for student mobility within the classroom? So again, that scholarship of teaching and learning with the principles underpinning it around internationalization. And we found a really innovative solution to that. And then taking a risk is my final point that I want to make. Uh, if we don't take risks in subtle, we don't promote our professions and move the professions forward. So I'm currently involved in an international work integrated learning research fellowship with Elon University in North Carolina. We're looking at how um, work integrated learning facilitates students across a range of healthcare professions to develop professional belongingness. And that's really um, going to be an interesting interesting piece of work starting with a, a scoping literature review that enables us to think about how we use different methods of pedagogical uh, principles within our curriculum delivery to ensure that our students through their learning understand who they are and where they belong. Um, so that's that's kind of the key messages coming out of my presentation today. I'm very conscious that there'll be probably be more questions, um, but we were we're given a very short time frame, so I want to stick to time, and I'm happy to take questions on on some of the work that I've shared with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you very much. Um, are there any 
We have time for one or two short questions before we continue with the next speakers. Are there any questions? Deborah, can you maybe stop sharing your screen because then just I can... going to do that. I'm trying to work out how to yeah. do that actually. But um, <laughs> there it is. Okay. Is there one or two very short que short questions about Deborah's presentation? I don't see no no short questions. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you very much, Deborah. Uh, Jesper, then I'll we will continue with last you. presentation, which is from Rianne. Yes. I uh, hope this works. Yes, can you see the screen? Yeah, we can, uh, Rianne. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's already nice uh, to to see the other presentation and see uh, yeah the the differences disciplinary differences maybe but also some common ground and um, here I'd like to share the um, yeah our experiences for me and Vincent who's also present here as um, uh, we are currently subtle advocates uh, of a university wide project in which Irma is involved uh, or which Irma set up and we. Um, well, we aim to facilitate uh, subtle within humanities. So here I will share my experiences, and we find that um, oh, yeah, the, so so humanities education and research in humanities is is quite um, yeah specific uh, in the sense that it it often emphasizes the importance of critical thinking and reflection, and the disciplines you see here these are disciplines uh, of. Um, humanities within Utrecht University, and of course, this also di can differ across universities. Uh, but um, our our idea of humanities is this uh, are these disciplines, and so so there's also huge differences actually within the humanities. But it's often about uh, in the in these ideas of critical thinking and reflection, and teachers also aim to understand the context and are less about how to innovate education actually but more understanding what is going on and that relates to the research methods they prefer as well so so they're less when when they aim uh, would like to do subtle for example they they uh, hesitate because i don't know the methods in that that are typical for educational sciences or to work with data and also they they feel more uh, comfortable but also they feel it's more uh, gives them more context uh, if they use methods such as case studies or narrative an analysis or to to construct arguments and that it they can really use it to reflect on what is happening and that's also I, I saw that um, in the chat as well because uh, indeed this is also described as um, the isolated interest special interest group from arts and humanities so it's nice to uh, so I referred to that there as well um, we, I also looked at this uh, special interest group to, to uh, see what examples there are. So actually, that's a quite nice source of, of looking what examples are there in Sotel for the Humanities, because it's not easy to look um, for examples for teachers. Uh, they have to, um, yeah, it, 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 it's quite, uh, it's, it's not readily, readily available to them. Um, so it's good to also give them uh, ideas on what, yeah, how, how they can use their own methods there. They feel more comfortable with and, and feel are important uh, to do subtle. So, um, well, here are some examples and it's indeed about uh, case studies, uh, qualitative analysis, um, for example, uh, this activity theory case study. So the results are also yeah less about uh, reporting is less about data, but more about uh, interpretation, actually. And um, well, what we did, um, we're currently doing to um, facilitate uh, SOTL in the humanities is, um, well, two different ways. Bottom up is more create a really community of interested teachers, which also creates the idea of having examples and uh, sharing them uh, together. Um, also to give them more ideas on what is subtle because they yeah it, it's with uh, yeah. uh, because it's not you uh, of course uh, their daily practice so it's good to give them a bit more context about that um, but what's also really important is to 
create incentives and link it to their professional development. Maybe that's not specific to the discipline. Um, but yeah, we, we do see that um, if it's only, so, so they're not, uh, yeah, they have to be really intrinsic, really motivated to innovate education, for example, to do SOTL, whereas you want to create incentives as well. And, and also, um, yeah, they, they uh, so emphasize that it's important if they do it. So uh, we try to see if there are incentives and uh, link it to their professional development. There's a fast overview of with Stockholm in the humanities. If there are questions, I'll take them. I will stop share. Wait. Yes. <laughs> are there any questions for Rihanna? Uh, Robert? Uh, hi, yes, thank you. Thank you for this uh, short presentation about this. I have one question. Always when we talk uh, to colleagues from humanities about SOTL and when they do SOTL, sometimes they have, um, we have issues with this term methods. So sometimes our colleagues tell us, I mean, I'm as a psychologist and an educational researcher, I'm used to the term methods. I know what I mean, you know, and I know what we talk about. But sometimes when we use this term, they say, yeah, but what is, what's a method? We don't use methods. And then we are looking for alternatives. So do you have a recommendation what we could use instead of method? Uh, good question. Maybe Vincent, uh, I know you're, are you still <clears throat> here? Do you have ideas? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think we do uh, use methods. Of course, we use methods. And there are certain uh, procedures that we're taking in our research. And I think it's part of the quality of humanities research to be explicit and transparent about the things that you're doing. Uh, having said that, I think there might be a difference in what, uh, um, and especially if I, uh, listening to Jesper, the, the problem is that within humanity subtle research, we're not very good at improving things. We're not that interested in improving. We're more interested in understanding. So. The, the method in, 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 in laying bare what the problem is and how to improve it is part of a, a, a different kind of methodological perspective as what we are doing. Not all of them, and the, the humanities is plural, and there's a lot of different perspectives within the humanities, of course. So uh, if someone from the humanities is saying we're not using a certain method, maybe they're referring to a certain methods that are part of the social sciences, but they do use a certain procedure. So I would ask them to describe the procedure, what they're doing. Okay, Jesper, you want to respond? Uh, you're, you're muted, uh, Jesper. Yeah, just to see, I, I completely understand that. Yeah, from the humanities, the the, the solid research is not focused on improving but on understanding. My approach into it is, uh, from a practitioner's point of view, we are responsible for some educations, and and I see problems, or I see problems that we don't really see uh, that needs improvement. But so it's yeah, difference in perspectives. Yeah, and and from a humanities perspective. Uh, we would be maybe more interested in the question in why uh, it is considered to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and I it, think, yeah, sorry, Rihanna. Oh, so yeah, no, I, I just want to say one quick, so it's also about how you describe, for example, a certain method, because indeed, uh, like in a social sciences paper, you would really re read structured, uh, like we used uh this number of participants and so maybe they're not really used to doing that so maybe it can be that they refer to that as well okay okay thank you um thank you all three of you for i think interesting presentations which really show some uh differences but also commonalities in the disciplines um i put in the chat right now some questions uh because we are now going to split up in four breakout rooms and you can talk with each other about what you hear do you recognize what you hear uh do you have 
similar ideas of what discipline are you from and what problems are do you encounter in your discipline? Uh, so you can exchange that with each other and we will talk about 15 minutes and five minutes to five, we will return to this uh, plenary room. Uh, any questions?